Well, my name is Aaron, uh, as I mentioned. Um, I've been a resident at Manassar Academy since March, um, and I lived at a, a Zen Buddhist temple in Michigan, in my hometown, for uh, about eight months before that, and have lived at several other centers here and there. So I've been. Um, uh, also, most of this talk is going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, yoga in. Uh, I'm pulling primarily from the tradition of Ashtanga Yoga, uh, which I've practiced for about five years with um, a teacher in my hometown and in my own time and my own practice, and then I continue this at Maple. So a lot of what uh, I'm interested in discussing is, um, yeah, that's important, is, so a lot of folks at Maple and in Buddhist communities, in my experience, uh, tend to come at practice from a very particular angle, um, that being uh, a progression through the stages of meditation through cultivating concentration. And um, I wanted to talk about a sort of slightly alternate way of viewing or thinking about the path uh, that I've absorbed through the practice of yoga, which has really supported my own thinking about about practice in my life and, and, um, and sort of balances or tempers, uh, evens out some of the, the tendencies I've found in Buddhist communities particularly, and vice versa, where I've, I think my yoga practice has been deepened significantly by working um, in a more, by formal meditation training that, that is oriented towards concentration, which is often can be neglected in yoga, yogic spaces. Um, so, yeah, I think um, between the, the approach in Ashtanga and the approach in Zen or other forms of Buddhism, I don't really view either approach as correct, but rather ways of seeing or approaching practice that each can work really well for somebody or depending on a person's personality they can work poorly so uh, different personalities seem to um, it definitely happens that people choose or practice in a way that supports their own tendencies so if somebody tends to be overly rigid, rigid or disciplined or self punishing then they go towards a practice that's like that and they can actually use practice to uh, m to feed certain tendencies where a more balanced or gentle approach could actually be the hard thing for them to do and be the one that, that mellows them out a little bit uh, and vice versa so some people just need the, a little bit more of a kick in the butt um, and that's actually the thing that is complementary to their to their personality, um, and so it's really that these are views that can be helpful to take on or put down, depending where we are in our life, where we are in our practice, because uh, they both work and they work differently in different ways. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the. Ashtanga Yoga, what is Ashtanga? Um, a lot of people, like, it's a buzzword that kind of floats around in yoga spaces, and I don't know how much familiarity both of you. Do you guys, do you have some familiarity with Ashtanga and with the Yoga Sutras? Great, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Yoga Sutras were um, written, consolidated, uh, created in some way uh, between 400 BC and 500 Common Era, so it's relatively contemporary with the formation of classical Buddhism. Um, and I've been doing some self-study on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali at Maple. Uh, and it's really interesting to see that the Buddhist commentators and the yoga commentators are writing back and forth to each other. So they're, you know, having debates all the while um, about who's right, about what particular issues. Is there a soul? Is there not a soul? Um, so it's really interesting. Uh, and it does seem that a lot of, that some of the particular ways that the practice is outlined in the, the Patanjali uh, in the Yoga Sutras is, it's hard to say how much Buddhist influence is there. 
and vice versa because there's a lot of commonality. Um, so we don't really know uh, how much overlap there is, but generally the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is the classical text oriented towards awakening uh, from the yogi perspective in that particular um, way of, of looking at, uh, at yoga. Uh, and it has a lot in common with the Buddhist view in that uh, concentration is viewed as basically the primary vehicle. Um, and there is a little bit of a difference though, um, and it, this comes in in the, the way the path is structured where, uh, so in Ashtanga Yoga, um, we have the first limb is ethics, yamas, and then the second limb um, is, or the niyamas, is the sort of internal and mental attitudes, ways of holding in mind that are conducive to practice. Uh, and then we have asana, which is postural yoga, which is what most people think about when they think about yoga, which is what happens in yoga classes and studios. And then um, the fourth one is pranayama, which is breath work. I'm sure you guys are relatively familiar with all this so far. Um, and so what's interesting to me here is the uh, that a full quarter of the path is asana and pranayama is sort of energetic prep work for meditation. There's this substantial amount of work that goes into preparing the body-mind system to be able to meditate effectively. Uh, and this is actually made even more explicit in, um, in the text in the Yoga Sutras where actually not very much time is spent exploring asana or pranayama in the yoga sutras. Um, like, relatively small number of sutras concern instruction uh, in those camps. Probably this was mostly taught between two teacher-student relationships or in other texts. Um, but what is explicit in the yoga sutras um, is I guess I'll also say that in, in my own practice, um, where I've, I've spent some time in Mysore in the scale of months um, in South India studying Ashtanga Yoga at the, the main, there's a main institute there in Mysore, um, and also with a teacher based in Michigan who's uh, very deep in uh, the sort of Patavi Joyce lineage of Ashtanga. Um, and the way I've seen it taught um, is generally my teachers have suggested a regular asana practice, good amount of asana, good amount of postural practice, some pranayama, some mantra, so uh, mantra or prayer, or um, and then self-study of scriptures, but not a lot of meditation. There's there's this sort of balanced period. Uh, early on in practice where it's advised to just take this, this holistic set of practices and condition the whole body-mind system into a state of like health and balance and well-being that can then easily move towards meditation with a straight, a stable base of practice. So maybe it'll be five years or so of, of mostly this kind of um, in some sense it's preparatory work, but in some sense it actually is the real work uh, because a lot of meditators I know struggle a lot with this kind of stuff of, of um, bringing your lifestyle into balance and bringing your practice into relationship and bringing your, uh, like having a good enough sense of your energy body to have clean boundaries and like there's a lot of work to be done in this space that um, basically the yoga tradition like front loads it. It's like you should really sort that out before you start thinking too much about samadhi. Um, and samadhi or deeper states of concentration arise as uh, naturally as you do them. Um, this is how I've been presented the teachings basically. Um, and I've been presented it completely differently in Buddhism where uh, you basically are thrown into the deep end of concentration practice and 
through just doing that a lot, eventually the other stuff sorts itself out, is sort of the, the notion, um, which has, uh, has its own intelligence if you do it enough. And so then neither is, again, neither is um, correct or incorrect. It's just noting the, the tendencies and the patternings here. Um, and so well, I think there's another interesting note which is that this was actually more true in Buddhism until about 100 years ago because uh, meditation wasn't widely taught to lay people until about 100 years ago and there was this fairly dramatic opening of the tradition um, to as, as Asian Buddhist teachers started sharing the Dharma with uh, Western students and with lay people and um, so the notion that the first thing you do when you would start practicing Buddhism is start meditation retreats is quite new um, and oftentimes I've uh, heard that if you you were a lay person and you'd go and you'd work with a monk in your community and mostly it would just be working on ethics they would just advise you advise you around how to live well in relationship and make merit and do you know, you might go walk, uh, you know, ambulate around the, the local puja of stupas and sort of do your best to, to get positive karma so that you get positive rebirth is often how Buddhism has been done. Um, and so, so there is actually some sense of this in Buddhism too, but uh, it's mostly in my exposure to Buddhism in the U.S. has been that uh, that meditation is very strongly emphasized. Um, so it's, I think it can be helpful to note that there's this, this balance point or this uh, a wider scope, wider way of seeing what this path is really doing. Um, so I want to ground this a little bit more now in uh, the text in the Yoga Sutras. Um, so in the first chapter, of the Yoga Sutras, which is the Samadhi Pada, Pada, um, not great with Sanskrit pronunciation, but uh, is basically this. The first chapter is about the the direct or the fastest path to awakening, to realization, um, which is the path of practice and dispassion or meditative absorption. So this is basically a instruction manual on. Uh, entering deep states of concentration and realizing uh, in, in the Yoga Sutras it's called directly comprehending Purusha or soul or uh, basically God in yourself. Um, and this is highly similar to how the path is described in Theravada Buddhism or in um, Zen in a lot of ways is you know, you're working to deepen concentration as much as possible. Um, even the description of the states of concentration lines up fairly, uh, fairly similarly between traditions here. Um, so, in a way, it looks it, to my eyes. It seems like the samadhi pada is um, maybe a condensed and much less thorough version of like a Buddhist text on meditation. Of, there's, of which there's many, like the Shubhi Maga. Um, and so, what's interesting though is the second chapter uh, in the Yoga Sutras, it, the second Pada, is about Kriya Yoga. And so it begins by saying, practice and dispassion, however, are difficult for the outgoing mind. So, uh, meditative absorption is a difficult path for the outgoing mind that is still under the influence of rajas and tamas, something like agitation and torpor, or... Uh, uh, are you familiar with the gunas? Yeah. Are you familiar with rajas and tamas, or sapa, to some extent? Oh, Ah, okay. Um, so they're basically these, the equivalent to the hindrances in Buddhism. Or the, um, and for such a temperament, the means outlined in this sutra produce purity of mind, um, or sattva. This is especially easily cultivated through the practice of kriya yoga, meaning the yoga of action. So, for certain kinds of people with certain kinds of 
uh, minds that make it very difficult to apply oneself to formal meditation practice, there is a, a practice that can lead one to that, lead one to the concentration uh, without, with a slightly different, basically, technique, a different approach. Um, so Kriya Yoga consists of tapas, is self-discipline, uh, Shvayaya is self-study, and Ishvara Pranidhana is devotion or surrender. Um, and so, I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about two of these, about tapas is discipline, and Ishvara Pranidhana is surrender. Um, Shvayaya is, I think, the most intuitive of the three, which is continuing to study the, the Dharma, the Dharma, and uh, through intellectual book study, or um, I think there's other ways you could think about it too. It's constant self-awareness, self-reflection. Um, but I'm really going to move on to tapas and pranidhana, um, or Ishvara pranidhana, as I think these are the most interesting to me in terms of what I've found support in uh, that is very distinct from Buddhism in a certain way, or I've never encountered similar ideas um, as thoroughly developed as in uh, my yogic pr practice. Um, and so, tapas, uh, so these are a few quotes from commentators in the Yoga Sutras on tapas. Uh, one says, tapas means control of the senses, controlling quantity, quality, regularity of one's food intake, for example, the quality of what one listens to, reads, or talks about. So there's this sense of uh, guarding or um, making sure that your sense mediums are uh, only intaking what is conducive to practice. And there's also the ability to tolerate hunger and thirst as well as the dualities of life to avoid useless talk and to perform fasts. So generally this sense of being okay in the body and able to go with whatever is happening. If you don't have enough food, then it's okay. If it's a little hot or a little cold, then you're, you're not pushing against your bodily experience. Um, and the other point that's mentioned that I find interesting though is that tapas should be of a gentle kind that will not disrupt the clarity of mind or weaken the body. Otherwise, says Sankara, if austerity and self-discipline are practiced in a way that disturbs the mind, they defeat the entire purpose of yoga, which is to still the mind. Uh, and so, tapas is not austerity. It's my, my experience of, of this quality and how I've sort of been uh, taught and instructed in it is that you're cultivating this, this like steady, slow burn. This, uh, it's like a blowing on an ember and you're just kind of, kind of trying to keep it alive and feed it, but you're not it's not a bonfire um, because it doesn't, you don't want to burn out all of the wood all at once. You don't want it to go very, very hard and then burn out. Um, and so there's this quality of just constant, constant practice, constant attention, constant application of some kind of energy to the process where you're just keeping this, this fire of practice alive. Um, and so I think of tapas as what fuels our daily practice. Um, and so there's another term that I want to introduce, which you guys likely have some familiarity with, uh, familiarity with as well, which is sadhana. There's daily practice, or um, I think that's the best way to, to describe sadhana as daily practice. Um, so I think of, yeah, I spent a long time in college a few years ago uh, basically practicing on my own, having relatively little community around. Um, and I think of tapas as the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you on the mat moving or like gets you on the cushion. There's this little move where it's pretty easy to not do that, but it's also, it's not a huge difference all the time, but it's the consistency like the consistency with which you make that decision is tapas, um, is this ability to just constantly be 
showing up, mm-hmm. constantly be there where it's necessary to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, there's also a thing I've noticed among uh, um, uh, I've seen some people uh, go into monasteries and practice very hard in that environment, but who don't know how to hold a very strong practice by themselves in the world. And so they oscillate between two extremes of practicing really, really hard in the monastery and then not practicing very much at all out in the world. And there's something about learning to hold your own fire. Whatever you guys are out in the world and you've been practicing for a while, then you probably have some ability or some, some training in this in your own experience. But I found it very valuable to think of this as its own form of skill, really. Can you hold your own fire? Um, and so, I have a few more quotes about tapa, or about sadhana. Um, this is a book from The Path of Practice uh, by Maya Tiwari. The sadhana, wholesome everyday practices observed in accordance with the cyclical rhythms of nature, spiritual practice that awakens the power of awareness, healthy, joyful rep- response to life. So what I find interesting here is the everyday <laughs> is, is mentioned. Uh, cyclical rhythms of nature is this interesting notion that your practice, that sadhana is also conveys this idea of balance or going with the environment you're in. So it's a steady application of pressure that might, you know, it might be pushed a little bit one way or another if you're like at Thanksgiving with your family or you're uh, in a context where um, you're not going incredibly hard all the time. You're not committing to sit a certain amount of time every day necessarily, but you show up in some way every day and you just keep that particular quality alive no matter what. Um, but there's also this element of like able to be moved or able to be uh, to be at ease with, with um, some degree of flow or some degree of, of cyclical or rhythmic nature of, of how practice changes in, in life. Um, and, and having enough faith to know that that's okay. <laughs> is very is very important um, and so this is a quote about physical practice in yoga and the evolution of faith by Annie Carpenter um, so she says if it hadn't been for the physical practice I never would have gotten here the ph- physical practice whether intense or gentle is the anchor for most of us that brings us to yoga it teaches us to practice and leads us to a kind of faith It teaches us to work vigorously and consistently over time and to patiently accept what is possible in this moment. We fall in love with the act of practicing. With unwavering faith, we place our bodies, minds, and hearts in showing up day after day to practice our yoga. Uh, And so we can see, again, this similar theme of uh, grounding in the body every day, no matter what. Uh, It could be intense, it could be gentle, it could move, it will move over time. Um, but just this repeated showing up gradually cultivates a kind of faith, a faith in the process, a faith in, uh, in well, really in the teachings and in ourselves. So this notion of faith brings us to the next point, the next uh, section which is um, Ishvara Pranidhana is the, the third of the supports to uh, Kriya Yoga. Um, this is devotional surrender. You might also think of it as faith. Um, and my experience is that uh, these ideas of tapas or discipline and daily practice uh, or sadhana are closely related to faith. That they, that they feed one another, um, that uh, they can kind of become this, this positive feedback loop where the slow uh, but constant kind of burn of our daily practice can become um, an offering. 
Uh, and this is, I guess, this is slightly different from how I've been taught to think about practice in uh, from Buddhist teachers as well, who um, there tends to be a little this goal orientation in Buddhism of, you know, you do the daily practice to awaken. Um, so there's a do X, get Y equation, which has its own merits. People uh, striving is, is its own, there's something worthwhile there. And so are you often, you know, is known for encouraging that kind of, that kind of attitude um, in practice. But there's, it's, it's sort of a slightly different strategy or different way of holding our daily practice to um, rather than doing it to get something else, we do it as a gift, we do it as an offering. Uh, and so we use this slow burn, this constant daily uh, rhythmic quality to our practice and each day we just show up and give ourselves to it and we give it away. Um, and so this is, this is what devotion means in the, the yoga tradition is, um, this is a lot of this is from the Bhagavad Gita which is the idea that we give away whatever we get through practice, through anything we get as a result of our actions, as a result of our, our, our work, our labor, is then given back to the world. We give it back to God, we give it back to the universe, immediately relinquish it. So you, you do things and you immediately relinquish the fruits and give it away. Um, so. This doesn't actually have to be directed towards God. I don't know. It depends on how you view your place in the world and whether you have some kind of a relationship with uh, the divine in that way. But you could also think of taking on an attitude of uh, equanimity or trust that what you are doing, that just the act of doing daily practice is correct. And that, that you aren't looking for something else aside from the, the experience that's there. Um, it's, it becomes a kind of equanimity that you're just, whatever is here today is the correct thing and it is a gift and I'm not looking for something outside of it. Um, so in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a few quotes. So this is Krishna talking to Arjuna who says, You have a right to perform your duties but not to their fruits. Do not consider yourself the doer of your activities and do not become attached to inaction. Uh, so you might be doing things, you might be in the middle of it all, um, but uh, it's not you. What you do is not you, and what you do, you immediately relinquish. Um, he also says, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you sacrifice, whatever you give away, what austerities you perform, or Arjuna, do it as an offering to me. So everything we do, eat, sacrifice, give away, whatever austerities, whatever tapas we have in our life, we, we give it away. So we use discipline uh, to cultivate energy, and all of that energy we give. Um, and so this can become a kind of positive feedback loop where we're, we're building this this fire of our daily practice, this stability and this commitment to, uh, to showing up. And in doing that, we also are giving it away. And that giving away uh, becomes a form of surrender and a form of building faith. So the fire of our, our discipline grows and the fire of our faith grows at the same time. Like love and discipline and faith all grow together. Um, and they can feed one another as you gain more faith it becomes more apparent why you would be disciplined. So it's more clear what the, the benefit is of, of, uh, of steadiness. And as you're more disciplined you experience deeper surrender and uh, that is the end in itself. <laughs> so you, it's kind of self-evident. Um, 
And so, yeah, one other point I love is that uh, in India, one of the most common forms of prayer is the fire puja, where um, a group of people will come together with a priest and have a fire, a big fire, a little fire, um, and make offerings to the fire of uh, ghee or all sorts of things that they might offer to a particular deity to make something or other happen in the form of a particular relationship with the deity. Um, and at the end of at the end of any particular prayer, they say swaha, as you release what you do into the flame. So you you make a prayer and you immediately give it away. And there's this word which is the act of giving away. And then it burns up and it goes up to heaven. Or it goes up. Um, and I think of it quite similarly, where you do your daily practice. And then you immediately give it away. <laughs> you don't want to hold on to it. You're not trying to build yourself with your daily practice. You're not trying to become bigger. Um, if you're doing that, then it's very confusing because you're trying to make yourself smaller and bigger at the same time, and that's not a good idea. Um, but on the other hand, you can you can use this motion of swaha, give it away as you do it um, immediately after 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 the action. Uh, so another point I found interesting, I haven't explored this very thoroughly, but um, there is a whole perspective within yoga, in, in bhakti yoga, in which um, some folks aren't actually aspiring for individual awakening because they view uh, this kind of process of deepening, ever deepening surrender to, um, to reality, to God, to be more enjoyable. It's basically this idea, it's like, this is actually better than awakening. And so it's better to be an individual soul in ecstatic relationship with God than it is to, to re-merge with reality as it is. So it's a really fascinating perspective and it's also not the perspective that's outlined by Patanjali. Um, Patanjali is more saying that this is the a faster way, a more effective way, is you cultivate devotion um, because that kind of love and that kind of surrender can make attaining deep concentration much faster. Very easy to concentrate your mind when you're experiencing deep surrender. Uh, and it can work through some kinds of things that are very difficult to work through through just brute force of, of awareness. Um, and so, yeah, you use, you use devotional surrender really as a vehicle for individual liberation uh, in this tradition. Um, I find that, you know, in my own experience, uh, both perspectives have um, have a way that they can go wrong, where I, it seems like a lot of people who I know practicing in the Ashtanga Yoga system only never really fully transition to doing deep sitting practice. And so they, they kind of really, really do um, limbs three and four really well. Uh, and there's a lot more there. Um, which doesn't really get brought up a lot. Uh, and it seems like uh, there's some Buddhists out there who have a really hard time with a lot of the material, like a lot of the sort of just basic energetic purification work that can be very difficult to do through just brute force sitting. Uh, it's not always, um, doesn't seem to be inevitable that it will just happen in any uh, short period of time. Um, and so I see these as, as sort of complementary teachings, complementary perspectives uh, that you know, every person has their own medicine of where they, where they are on this. And so, uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
This is an interesting point. Um, I do have uh, some notes here about uh, the importance of winds, or the potential importance of winds three, four, or asana and pranayama. Um, I'm not sure to what extent you guys have practiced with this. You probably have some degree of practice with asana and pranayama, but basically just saying that it's a very uh, powerful world to explore. Um, particularly if you have primarily an emphasis on seated meditation, it can just help to bring and move things a lot. Um, but there's one point I found really interesting that I've been thinking about, which is, um, I found physical movement to be such a powerful tool um, for my own process. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, this wasn't even, it's not really mentioned in Buddhism. Uh, there's, you know, not very much work with the body. Uh, and so I was thinking about this, but then I also was thinking about what was the life of the average Theravada, like, you know, the monk in the Buddha Sangha. 2,500 years ago, um, you're a monk in ancient India. Probably the degree of physical exercise or exertion that they're doing in their daily life is significantly higher than our, like what we think of as nothing or as sedentary. Um, and I was, I also read this, this some of this book by Ajahn Chah, or by one of Ajahn Chah's students who interviewed him. Ajahn Chah was a very famous Thai forest master um, from the 20th century, who, uh, you know, they they were living basically a classical Buddhist lifestyle, following the Vinaya out in the woods in Thailand, um, and would, you know, they would wake up at early in the morning, meditate, and then they would get their bowls and walk several miles, maybe three or four miles, into the nearest village, not having eaten since the previous day at 11, so they're, they've been fasting for 16, 17 hours, and they get these... <laughs> bowls full of food, so it's all the food they're going to eat for a day, so it's three or four pounds of food, hold it out like this. They're wearing these big robes, and then they walk three or four miles back to the, their huts, um, still not having eaten anything before they eat. And this is their, their daily routine is more physical exercise than most people do ever. Um, and I just having this thought of like, Oh, maybe the maybe the reason the Buddha didn't talk about this was because it was so universal that people used their bodies that they he just didn't feel like it was an important thing to mention. Whereas now we like don't really, you know, <laughs> we uh, now it needs to be an instruction basically. So Sori does does make this quite clear where he we have an hour to do body practice in the mornings and he's like you should be using your body every day in some way, like, pretty vigorously. Um, and, and that this is, this is, can be a part of practice. It can be a very supportive and stabilizing uh, piece or way of, of um, actually calming the whole nervous system, which can support concentration. So another, maybe more, uh, asana might just be a more, like explicit technique for doing that um, is one way you could think about it. But generally, I think the, the main things that I wanted to, to share in this talk um, were uh, the importance of the quality of steadiness or tapas, this sort of even discipline, this even ongoing fire in our practice. Um, and the relationship between that and building faith uh, that no matter what comes up, no matter what arises in our life, we can feed it to that fire, we can give it away. Um, and we just practice giving everything away to the fire through, through the daily, just the mundane daily sitting practice or daily yoga practice or and this might be broken up by retreats or might not, but um, there's this almost like plodding or like hmm. yeah it's a very consistent quality um, 
Yeah, the other thing I have written here is to make each day of sitting, each day of daily practice, like into an act of love. Like to consider how we're holding our practice. And is it, are we doing it to get something? Are we doing it to give something? Are we doing it to, uh, as an act of surrender, as an act of love, or as an act of um, something else? Very interesting inquiry. Because there's the what you're doing, but there's also the how, uh, the how you're doing it. Um, and I found that uh, can be very helpful sometimes to see, to make, to, to be aware of. Um, and yeah, the other, there's a, so there's some point about balance, about, um, you know, if you notice that you have a tendency to hold your practice in one way, so you're like, is that my pattern? Is there something in me that really likes that way? Do I hold other aspects of my life in that way? Like with overly rigid or overly disciplined or overly, um, you know, holding too tightly is one way that I've held my practice in the past. And noticing that I actually do that with everything. So the way I'm practicing is actually supporting how I am rather than challenging how I am. And there might be other ways of upholding your practice that, that you can reflect on and, and try to move into the other direction or try to challenge uh, what you're used to doing. Um, it can be really, really helpful. So it might mean, you know, for there's people uh, who seem to be doing the really hard thing, like they're doing the really good thing, which is the rigorous and disciplined and ascetic form of, of practice and um, sometimes the faster thing is actually mellowing out a little bit or actually being a little bit gentle or just practicing kindness with yourself can be harder to do um, and so there's a way in which the fastest approach is not always you know it's not like it's not like um with a lot of things in our society, the more force you put into it, the faster it goes. And we're, we're very trained to think that force is speed. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be true in my experience with this kind of work. Force does not necessarily equal speed. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, so I had this, uh, yeah, I've had this process in my last five years or so of um, learning to balance these qualities of, of how do you have a lot of discipline, uh, a lot of energy in practice, but stay soft enough that that discipline doesn't become tightening. And how do you, if it's easy for you to be soft, how do you become disciplined enough but not disrupt that softness? And so there's this kind of play back and forth there where you can easily go, you know, a little bit too disciplined and you're, you're actually, um, pushing against yourself in a certain way, or you can be a little bit, you know, too soft and you could, you could bring up the fire a little bit. Um, and so it seems to be like one of the main questions in my, in my practice for a long time. Uh, so I have a little quote or saying that came to me um, a few years ago when I was thinking about my practice and I didn't know what to do and I was experiencing a lot of trouble with it. And the thought was like, if I'm working in my life to embody kindness, if I want to become as kind as I can, then the fastest way to do that is probably going to be the kindest way to do that. And so the, the actual means, the actual way that we go should reflect what we want to be. Uh, and that was really powerful for me to, to look at my practice and say, am I practicing kindly? Um, am I practicing in a way that's kind to myself and kind to others? Or am I trying to brute force myself into kindness? Not gonna, it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, and so I'll just end, end with that note.